And when we last left off, we were discussing molarity and molarity calculations. We're now going to focus a little bit on soluble ionic compounds and ion molarity. Now, we know from our previous discussion of ionic compounds is that in solution, soluble ionic compounds will dissociate to yield their component ions in solution. So for example, if you have something like potassium sulfide in solution, it will not remain as a discrete molecule of ionic compound. Instead, it will quickly dissociate into, in solution into its component ions. Now, as we can see very clearly, the moles of ion in solution per mole of ionic compound is based on the chemical formula. So for example, if you have a formula like copper chloride, CuCl3 aqueous, and you place it into solution, we see that in copper chloride's formula, we have one copper three plus ion. And how many chloride ions do we have as part of our formula? Three. How many chloride ions do we have? Three. Ah, one moment. So how many ions do we have? How many chloride ions Three. do we have? Three, exactly right, perfect. Okay, so as we can see, based on our chemical formula, we can determine the number of ions of each cation and anion that would be generated as our ionic compound dissolves and dissociates in solution. Here's another example. So looking at sodium sulfide, looking at sodium sulfide, if we start off with one mole of sodium sulfide, we know that from the formula, sodium sulfide will dissociate into two sodium ions and one sulfide ion. In other words, we know that the moles of sodium plus ion are equal to the moles of sodium sulfide times our formula ratio, which is two moles of sodium plus per one mole of sodium sulfide, which would give us two moles of sodium plus. So from this, we can relate the molarity and moles of ionic compound to the molarity and moles of ions using our formula ratio just like we've done in previous chapters when we relate the moles of a compound to the moles of an atom or ion. Does that idea make sense? Okay, so Continuing on with that idea, let's show an application of this. So a researcher made a 0 0.20 molar solution of sodium nitride, and we're asked to calculate the molarity of each ion in solution. So just to draw a picture, just to draw a picture, just to help us get a sense of what's going on here. We have our sodium ions. We have our nitride ion. Okay, and we know that sodium nitride in solution will break down into the sodium and nitride ions. It will dissociate into its component ions in solution. And in turn, we know from the formula, we see we have three sodium ions and one nitride ion. Okay, so now that we have this pe pictorial representation established, 
we can now utilize that pictorial representation in order to complete and solve this problem. Okay, so if we have 0 0.2 moles of sodium nitride per one liter, my question to all of you is how many moles of sodium plus do we have per mole of sodium nitride? What's our mole to mole ratio? Three to one. Yep, exactly right. We have three moles of sodium per one mole of sodium nitride. And that in turn gives us 0 0.6 moles of sodium plus per one liter. We can repeat this same calculation for nitride. If we have 0 0.2 moles of sodium nitride per one liter, and we know that we have one mole of nitride per one mole of sodium nitride, that gives us 0 0.2 moles of nitride per one liter. Does that idea make sense to everyone? Perfect. So then let's apply what we've seen previously and let's work through the following example. In this case, a researcher made a 1.50 molar solution of cesium sulfate and we're asked to calculate the molarity of each ion in solution. So let's take about four minutes to work through this example. We first need a viable, reasonable formula for cesium sulfate. And once we have the formula, we can start to use our formula ratio to solve for the concentration of each ion in solution. So looking just to voice some student comments that we've noted and some, some observations that students have noted, we have a student proposing a viable formula for cesium sulfide, or sorry, cesium sulfate. So in this case, we have cesium plus, sulfate is SO4 two minus. We cross the charges and that gives us CS2SO4. Now from this information and from this formula of cesium sulfate, we can keep going and we can calculate the molarity of each ion in solution. So let's keep working on this. We have our formula established. Thank you for those who shared your responses in the chat. Let's now keep going with this and let's use the formula and formula ratio to calculate the concentration of each ion in solution. And we're starting to see some responses in the chat for the ion concentrations. Let's try to get a few more proposed responses in the chat from other students in this class. And then we'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. 
Okay, so let's discuss this example. So in this case, if we have 1.50 moles of cesium sulfate per one liter, we know from our formula, we see we have two moles of cesium plus per every one mole of cesium sulfate. And that gives us 3.00 moles of cesium plus per one liter. Likewise, if we have 1.50 moles of cesium sulfate per one liter, we know that we have one mole of sulfate per every one mole of cesium sulfate. And that in turn gives us 1.50 moles of sulfate per every one liter. Does this problem make sense to everyone? Any questions on this example? Okay, so let's keep going now and let's keep building on this idea and let's talk next about solutions and dilution. So if, if we think a little bit about a picture of what a dilution looks like, first let's define what a dilution is. It's addition of solvent to a solution to ultimately change its final volume. Now, during a dilution, if all we're doing is adding solvent, the moles of solute does not change during a dilution. So for example, we have five moles of, let's just say sodium plus ions in one liter of solution. If we then add an additional liter of if we then add an additional liter of solvent, we have increased the total volume of our solution. We've increased the amount of solvent added. But at any point, have we changed the amount of solute dissolved? Does the number of solute molecules dissolve? Does the moles of solute change in this process now that we've added additional solvent? No. It does not, exactly right. We're only changing the amount of solvent. The moles of solute do not change during a dilution. As a result, we can write out the moles of solute as the molarity times the volume. And we know that during a dilution, since the moles of solute does not change, the moles of solute at the start of our dilution must match the moles of solute at the end of our dilution. Now we can take this one step further. And we know that when solutions are mixed, the final volume is the total volume of each solution. So for example, if you start with if you start with a liter of solution and you add an additional one liter of solvent, your final volume will be the sum of your initial volume and the volume of solvent added. So we see one plus one, we'd have a final volume of two liters. So you can figure out you can figure out your final volume by taking the volume that you initially start with for your solution plus the volume of solvent that you added. Now with these two concepts in mind, with these two concepts in mind, we can solve for the concentration of a solution before or after any dilution using the following equation. 
So we know, we know previously that the moles before the dilution begins and the moles after a dilution, the moles of solute do not change. We know we can write the moles of solute in terms of molarity and volume. And as a result, we have an expression that relates our initial molarity and volume of our overall solution to the final molarity of our solute and the final volume of our solution. So we can use this equation to determine the final concentration after, di after a dilution and to determine the amount of a concentrated solution that we need to add or dilute to generate a solution with a defined molarity. So this equation is based on this idea that we're only adding solvent. We're only changing the overall amount of solvent and the overall volume of our solution. This equation does not work if the amount of solute changes in any way. Does this equation make sense? And does everyone understand the, the limitations and parameters for this equation? Okay, so let's look at an example. So 20 milliliters of a 6.0 molar sodium hydroxide solution is mixed with 230 milliliters of water to yield a dilute sodium hydroxide solution. And we're asked to determine the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution. So we know our initial volume is 20.0 milliliters. We know that our initial molarity is 6.0 molar. Okay, we have added, we have added 230.0 milliliters of water. So in turn, our final volume would be 20.0 milliliters plus, whoops, one moment, plus 230.0 milliliters, which gives us a final volume of 250.0 milliliters. Okay, we're then asked to figure out the final concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution. So we know that our initial molarity times our initial volume, which is representing our initial moles, are equal to the moles of solute after dilution. So the moles of solute after dilution can be written as the final molarity of our solution, the final molarity of solute in our solution times the final volume. Okay, now we can solve for our final molarity algebraically. And now all we have to do is plug in our numbers. So our initial molarity is 6.0 molar for sodium hydroxide. Our initial volume is 20.0 milliliters, and our final volume is 250.0 milliliters. Since we have the same units of milliliters, the units cancel. So punching this into our calculator, we have six times 20 over 250, and that gives us a final molarity of 0 0.48 molar. Notice you need to make sure your volume units are the same so that they cancel. If the volume units are not the same, you're going to need to do a unit conversion to make sure that they cancel properly. Does this make sense to everyone? Any questions on this example? Okay, so now that we've seen a representative example, let's try now to apply what we've learned and let's work on the following problem, 
over the next four to five minutes. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat for this second question, and then we'll discuss in about three to four minutes. And it looks like we're getting a reasonable pool of responses in the chat. So we'll give students about another minute to a minute and a half before we discuss. Just to try to get as many different student responses as possible and to give students adequate time to double check their calculations in their cal and make sure that there are no calculator errors. Okay, so let's talk about this example. So we know the initial volume of our solution is 12 milliliters. The initial molarity is 12.0 molar. We also know, we also know from this available information, we also know that our added volume of solvent is 490 milliliters. So then our final volume would be 500.0 milliliters. Now, all we have to do is solve for our final molarity. So we know that the molarity initial times the volume initial, which represents our initial moles of solute are equal to the final moles of solute, which are equal to the final molarity times the final volume of solution. So now that we have that set up, now let's just solve for our final molarity. And that gives us 10.0 milliliters times 12.0 molar over 500.0 milliliters. So we have 10 over 500 times 12. And that gives us a final molarity of hydrochloric acid of 0.24 molar. Isn't that supposed to be pretty significant? Yes, yes. And that's just about what I was going to notice and note. Because our inputs, our least precise input has three sig figs, it needs to be reported as 0 0.240. Respecting the fact that this leading zero is not significant, but all of these trailing digits after the decimal point and after a non-zero number are significant. Yes, that's very important to note. Professor, where do you get the 500.0 milliliters? Ah, so we're calculating the final volume by adding our initial volume plus the volume of solvent added. So the 500 is obtained by adding our initial volume with the volume of solvent, water, that was added. So 10 plus 490 gives us 500. Okay, got it. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions on this example? Okay, so let's now try to solve a different format of molarity question. So we have 200 milliliters of a 0 0.6 molar solution of potassium chloride and it's diluted to a final concentration of 0.1 molar. 
and we're asked, what is the volume of this 0 0.1 molar KCl solution? Okay, so let's fill in what we know. Our initial molarity is 0 0.60 molar. Our initial volume is 200 milliliters. We know our final molarity. And what are we trying to solve here? What are we trying to solve for in this problem? In this particular problem, what are we trying to figure out? Yeah, the final volume. We're trying to figure out the final volume of our dilute solution. Okay. So then solving for our final volume, we get molarity initial times volume initial over molarity final. That gives us 0 0.60 molar times 200 milliliters over 0 0.10 molar. The units of molarity cancel. And as a result, we're left with units of milliliters. Okay, so punching this in, we have 0 0.6 whoops, 0.6 times 200 over 0 0.10. And that gives us a volume of 1,200 milliliters that we can write as 1.2 liters. That is one significant. Yeah, I'm gonna put a dot at the end just so that way we don't have to round this to 1,000. If you're reading the problem as is, you'd round this to a thousand milliliters. Um, but if there was a dot at the end here, we just round it to the least precise molarity value, which would be 1.2 liters, which is practically the amount of precision that you typically deal with when you're doing these kinds of large scale dilutions. But you are correct in noting that the way the problem is currently set up, we'd report our final answer to one sig fig, if we're dealing with 200 dot, we'd round to two sig figs. Uh, yeah, because you have to have the zero. Yeah. And just because practically, if you dispensed only a thousand, you wouldn't have the correct dilution factor. If you diluted to a final volume of, of one liter, you wouldn't quite have the correct dilution factor. But that is correct to note, and it's good to see that we're paying attention to sig figs throughout these problems. Does this dilution example make sense to everyone? In this case, we're figuring out the total volume that we need to dilute to, to generate a dilute solution. Okay, so let's now try to do an example as a class. So in this case, a student prepares a 0 0.15 molar sodium sulfate solution by diluting a three molar solution to a final volume of 100 milliliters. And we're asked what volume of this concentrated solution is required to prepare 100 milliliters of 0 0.15 molar sodium hydroxide and just put a dot at the end of the 100 milliliters. So just treat it as 100 dot milliliters. So the sig figs are a little bit more precise and that way you're able to report more sig figs and report volumes that you practically handle in the lab. So let's work on this example for about three to four minutes and then we'll discuss. And let's try to get a few responses in the chat as well. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask. Don't be shy to ask in the chat or verbally. 
So we, it's great to see we have a range of responses in the chat. Uh, keep in mind that if you're converting to leaders, if you or if you converted to leaders, make sure to change the units as well as the number that you report. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and we'll discuss in about a minute and a half to two minutes. Okay, so it's great to see the range of responses that we have in the chat. So let's talk about this example and let's read through the problem and figure out what information we have. So this is the solution that we've prepared. So our final molarity is 0 0.15 molar. Our final volume is 100 milliliters. Our initial molarity of our concentrated stock is 3.0 molar. What are we trying to figure out in this problem? What quantity are we trying to calculate? So what is this problem asking us to calculate? Initial volume. Yep, exactly right. So solving for our initial volume, we have the final molarity times the final volume over the initial molarity. So we have 0 0.15 molar times 100 milliliters over 3.0 molar. So punching this into our calculator, we have 0 0.15 times 100 over three. And that gives us a final volume, uh, sorry, that gives us at the end of the calculation, our initial volume of five mils which we report to two sig figs because our least precise measurements, which are our molarities have two sig figs. Does this example make sense to everyone? Professor, what's the good way to look at, um, to see like what the question is asking us, what we're looking for, what's the best way to look at it? So in this case, we're explicitly asked, what is the volume of stock solution? And the stock solution is the initial solution that we have before dilution. So you, usually the, there's background information provided in the problem and then a, a explicit question. And I would look for the section with the explicit question and try to highlight what what it's asking from that question. So in this case, we're asked what volume of stock solution is required to prepare this dilute solution. And so we highlight this volume term and we know that the stock solution is our initial solution. So we're trying to figure out the initial volume. Does that idea make sense? A little bit, thank you. So essentially you separate the background information, which is just additional numerical values that you need to solve the problem from the explicit the explicit goal or the explicit quantity that you're that you're asked to calculate in these questions does that make sense yes thank you perfect okay so let's take a look at the following example and let's try another attempt. In this case, we're asked how many liters of 0 0.1 molar potassium dihydrogen phosphate solution would be required to make five liters of 0 0.05 millimolar solution. 
So in this case, we have a prefix modifier where the milli prefix corresponds. So one millimolar corresponds to 10 to the negative third molar, where the milli prefix corresponds to the power of 10 of 10 to the negative third. So let's take about three to four minutes to work through this example, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And if there are any questions as you work through these examples, don't be shy to let me know. Additionally, don't be shy to share your responses in the chat as we work through these problems. I'd like to see a, a range of responses from multiple students in the class before we discuss in about another two and a half to three minutes. And it's good to see that we have a range of responses in the chat and we'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. Let's try to get a few more responses. And then we'll discuss in about another 30 seconds to a minute. Okay. So let's discuss in this case. So we know that our stock solution, which is our initial solution, has a molarity of 0 0.1 molar. We know that our final volume is 5.0 liters and our final molarity is 0 0.05 millimoles. So in this case, we're asked to solve for our initial volume. And we know the initial volume is equal to the final molarity times the final volume over the initial molarity, which would give us in turn 0 0.05 times 10 to the negative third molar, because remember one millimolar is equal to 10 to the negative third molar. Our final volume is 5.0 liters and our initial molarity is 0 0.1 molar. So punching this into our calculator, we have 0 0.05 times 10 to the negative third times five over 0 0.1. And that in turn gives us 0 0.0025 liters, 0.0025 
that we round to 0 0.003 liters, respecting the fact that our inputs have one significant figure. Does this question make sense to everyone so far? Any questions so far? Professor, I have trouble um, calculating when we're multiplying the 0 0.05 times 10 to the negative 3. So you'd enter it as 0 0.05, and then you'd hit the EE button on your calculator, and then enter negative 3. Does that work with your calculator? Yeah, doing it right now. Perfect, perfect. Any other questions on this example? Okay, so let's work on one more example for additional practice. In this case, we're asked how many liters of 6.0 molar sodium hydroxide stock solution would be required to prepare 500 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide. So let's work on this example over the course of the next two to three minutes, and then we'll discuss this example momentarily. Let's try to get a few responses in the chat before we discuss this example. And let's try to get a few more responses in the chat before we discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. And it's great to see the range of proposed student responses. Let's try to get a few more responses and we'll discuss this example in about another 30 seconds. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's talk about this question. So we're asked how many liters of six molar sodium hydroxide stock solution is needed to prepare 500 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide. So then solving for our initial volume, we have 0 0.2 molar times 500 milliliters over 6.0 molar. And that in turn gives us an initial volume of 16.6 milliliters that we in turn round to 20 milliliters because our input for our volume only has one sig fig. Does this example make sense to everyone? Any questions on this example? It asked for liter, so it's supposed 0 0.02. Yep, exactly right. So then we're gonna take our 20 milliliters and we know that in, we know that in one milliliter, we have 10 to the negative third liter and that would give us 0 0.02 liters. You can also write this as two times 10 to the negative second liters, yep. So in this case, because the units were specified in the problem, we'd have to convert our volume in milliliters to liters. Any other questions on this example? Any other comments on this example? Professor. Um, I don't understand how you got the 20 in ounce um, so if we got the 16.6. Yes, and because our input volume only has one sig fig, we'd have to round our input to a final number of sig figs of one sig fig. Oh, okay, got it. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. It's you, well, you can round before or after converting in this case, and it would not change, it would not make a difference. Does that address the question in the chat? Okay, so let's keep going now. And let's talk a little bit about what happens when you mix ionic solutions. So if you're mixing solutions with the same ion present in both solutions, you can't simply use the dilution equation. You can't simply use the dilution equation. The reason for that is when you mix the solutions, you're changing the amount of solute present. So then, looking at this example, if we have one liter of one molar sodium bromide mixed with one liter of one molar sodium chloride, the way to handle these mixing problems where you have a common ion present in both of your solutions, the first thing you have to do is convert the molarity of each solution to the moles of ionic compounds. Okay, so then what we're doing is we're essentially calculating the moles of each ion present in our solution. So the moles of sodium plus and sodium bromide, we have one liter times one mole of sodium bromide per one liter. And we know that we have one mole of sodium plus per one mole of sodium bromide. So that gives us one mole of sodium plus. We can repeat the same calculation for bromide. So we get one liter times one molar times one mole of bromide per one liter. And that gives us our moles of bromide of one mole of bromide. We can repeat this calculation for sodium chloride. 
So in this case, we're gonna figure out the moles of sodium plus in our sodium chloride solution. So we have one liter and we have one mole of sodium chloride per one liter. And we know that we have one mole of sodium plus per mole of sodium chloride. And that gives us one mole of sodium plus. Our moles of chloride in this case are one liter times one molar times one mole of chloride. per one mole of sodium chloride. And that gives us for our moles of chloride, one mole of chloride. Now what we have to do is calculate the total moles of each ion. So in this case, our only common ion is sodium. And as we can see visibly from our picture, if we have one mole of sodium each and we mix these two solutions, our final moles of sodium would be two moles of sodium. So our total moles of sodium are equal to one mole of sodium plus one mole of sodium, which gives us two moles of sodium. Okay, now that we have the moles of each of our ion, we're gonna calculate the total volume. So the total volume is obtained by adding up the volume of each of the solutions we've mixed together. So we have a liter and a liter mixed together. So our total volume would be one liter plus one liter, which is two liters, okay? Now that we have the total moles of, of each of our component ions kept separately, we also have the total volume. We can calculate the molarity of each component ion individually. Okay, so in this case, the molarity of sodium plus would be equal to two moles of sodium plus per two liters, which gives us one mole of sodium plus per one liter. Conversely, if we look at the, at the so this should be concentration of sodium plus. In other words, the molarity of sodium plus. And other, it, but conversely, if we're looking at one of our component ions that's only present in one of our solutions, then this process just simplifies to our dilution equation. So the molarity of chloride or the concentration of chloride would be the moles of chloride, which is one mole of chloride over the total volume, which is two liters. And as we see, the molarity of chloride would be 0 0.5 molar. So we can go through and we can calculate the concentration of each of our ions after mixing a set of solutions. The main difference between this method and the dilution equation method is that this method is utilized when you're mixing solutions that have a common ion. When your moles of solute or the moles of a specific ionic solute are changing when you mix the solutions together. Not a, it's not a reaction. It's just the fact we have a common ion in both of our solutions. So when we mix our solutions, the total amount of that common ion, such as our sodium, for example, the total amount of our common ion changes during this mixing process. Does that idea make sense to everyone? Does that idea make sense? So you calculate the total moles, divide by the total volume, and that gets you the molarity. Does that process make sense? Does this process that we've outlined make sense? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So now that we've seen an example, let's take a look at the following problem. In this case, we're asked to calculate the concentration of sodium when 0.1 liters of 
molar sodium phosphate is mixed with 0.2 liters of 0.1 molar sodium cyanide. Okay, now it's really important that when we're calculating the concentration of an ion, we're attentive to our formulas. So let's look first at sodium phosphate. So the moles of sodium in sodium phosphate would be equal to our volume which would be 0 0.1 liters times our molarity, which is 0 0.5 moles of sodium phosphate per one liter. And now how many moles of sodium plus, how many moles of sodium ions do we have per mole of sodium phosphate? Three to one. Yep, exactly right. And that in turn gives us 0 0.1 times 0 0.5 times three. That gives us 0 0.15 moles of sodium plus. We'll retain an excess number of sig figs for now before we simplify at the end of our calculations. Okay, let's look at sodium cyanide now. For our moles of sodium plus, we have the molarity of sodium cyanide times the volume. And then how many moles of sodium plus do we have per mole of sodium cyanide? What's our mole to mole ratio? One to one. One to one, exactly right. And that in turn gives us 0 0.02 moles of sodium plus. So then calculating our total moles of sodium plus would be equal to 0 0.15 plus 0 0.02, which gives us 0 0.17 moles of sodium plus. We also know that our total volume is obtained by adding up the volume of each of our solutions, which is 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 liter, which gives us 0 0.3 liters. And our molarity in turn would be 0 0.17 moles of sodium plus over 0 0.3 liters. And that in turn so you have 0 0.17 over 0 0.3. And that gives us a final molarity of 0 0.56 molar that we in turn then round to 0 0.6 molar to respect the fact that our input values only have one significant figure. Does this example make sense to everyone? Yes. Perfect. So let's look at the follow-up case. In this case, we're asked to calculate the concentration of cyanide when 0 0.1 liters of 0 0.5 molar sodium phosphate is mixed with 0 0.2 liters of 0 0.1 molar sodium cyanide. So first things first, we need to figure out the moles of cyanide, which we get from our sodium cyanide solution. So we have 0 0.2 liters times 0 0.1 moles of sodium cyanide per one liter times one mole of cyanide per one mole of sodium cyanide. And that in turn gives us 0 0.02 moles of cyanide. We know previously that our total volume is 0 0.3 liters. Now, would someone care to explain why I'm not looking at sodium phosphate for any ion calculations in this second example? Does it, doesn't, it doesn't include the CMI. 
Yep, exactly right. Sodium phosphate does not have any cyanide ion, and as a result, doesn't contribute to the moles of cyanide in our final solution. Exactly right. We know previously our total volume is 0 0.3 liters. So then the concentration of cyanide ion is 0 0.02 moles of cyanide over 0 0.3 liters. And that in turn gives us 0 0.067 molar cyanide that we then round to 0 0.07 molar cyanide as our final molarity. Does this example make sense to everyone? Yes. Perfect, perfect. So, Let's now try to apply what we've learned and let's look at the following example. So in this case, a solution is made by mixing 175 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar potassium phosphate with 27 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar potassium chloride. Assuming the volumes are additive, what are the molar concentrations of the following two ions? So let's spend about five minutes on this example. This is something that you won't necessarily see on exam two, but is fair game for exam three. And it's a higher order example covering solution concentrations of ions. So let's spend about five to six minutes on this example, and then we'll discuss. And if there are any questions as you work through these problems, don't be shy to ask in the chat. And again, don't hesitate to share your proposed responses in the chat. One thing to keep in mind is that you may need to convert the volumes into liters for the two-step method. And let's keep working through this example. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask in the chat. And let's try to get a range of responses in the chat as we continue to work through this example. 
And don't be shy to ask any questions as you work through these examples. And then we'll discuss in about another three to four minutes. Let's try to get a few more responses or questions in the chat, and then we'll talk through the, these examples in another two and a half to three minutes. I want to give students the opportunity to work through a complete problem similar to what you'd see on an exam. And it's great to see the range of possible solutions in the chat. Let's keep working through this example and we'll discuss in about a minute and a half to two minutes. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask in the chat. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. So looking at chloride, there's only one source of chloride, which is potassium chloride. So first we'll figure out the moles of chloride. And to do that, we'll take our volume, which is 27.0 milliliters times the molarity of potassium chloride, which is 0 0.2 moles of potassium chloride per one liter. We know that we have 10 to the negative third liter per mil. And we know that we have one mole of chloride per every one mole of potassium chloride. 
So punching that into our calculator, our moles of chloride would be 27 times 0 0.2 times 10 to the negative third. That in turn gives us 0 0.0054 moles of chloride. So then the concentration of chloride would be equal to the moles of chloride over the liters of our solution. We know that our total volume is equal to 175 milliliters plus 27 milliliters. So our volume total in this case would be equal to 202 milliliters. And we know that there are 10 to the negative third liter per mil. So our total volume is 0 0.202 liters. So for our concentration of chloride, we take the moles of chloride over the total volume in liters. And that gives us a final concentration of chloride of 0 0.0. 27 molar. Rounded to two sig figs because our moles are reported to two sig figs. You have three, three sig figs. Let me check. Two zero zero. So this should be five four zero. Yep. Yep. Yes, you are correct. So we'd report this as 0 0.0267 molar. Yep, perfect. Okay, any questions on this first calculation where we're calculating the concentration of chloride? Okay, so let's work on potassium plus now. So first we're gonna calculate the moles of potassium plus from potassium chloride. So in this case, we take our volume, which is 27.0 milliliters times molarity, which is 0 0.200 moles of potassium chloride. We know that there are 10 to the negative third liter per mil and that we have one mole of potassium per one mole of potassium chloride. That in turn gives us 0 0.00540 moles of potassium plus. Next, we're gonna figure out the moles of potassium plus from our potassium phosphate. So in this case, we have 175 milliliters and our molarity in this case is 0 0.100 molar. So we have 0 0.100 moles of potassium phosphate per one liter. We know that we have 10 to the negative third liter per mil and we know how many moles of potassium do we have per mole of potassium phosphate? What's three our to mole? One. Three to one, exactly right. Perfect. So punching that into our calculator, we have 175 times 0 0.1 times 10 to the negative third times three. That gives us 0 0.0525 moles of potassium. So then our total moles of potassium are equal to 0 0.0525 moles of potassium plus 0 0.00540 moles of potassium. And that in turn gives us 0 0.0579 
moles of potassium plus. We also know that our total volume, our total volume was previously calculated to be 0 0.202 liters. So then putting that together, our concentration of potassium plus is equal to our total moles over our total volume. And that in turn gives us 0 0.287 molar. Just to be specific, molar potassium plus. Does this example make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with this example? Perfect. So, with that, um, we've finished up this chapter. This is a good stopping point for today's lecture. So let's 